I think most preachers probably have a story to tell and share about their very first sermon ever. For some reason, we, we can't forget those. Try as we would like to forget those. We, we, we can't forget that very first sermon. And mine came in Nebraska. I was a student at Nebraska Christian College. And it um, wasn't unusual for smaller churches in the area to ask for a, a young preacher boy to come down and, and share the message. I was a senior. I'd never preached before, and I'd never held a weekend ministry. And, and so I was pretty nervous. I was probably the last one that was to be asked. Everybody else probably had a commitment. This was in Holdridge, Nebraska, where the, the Dyers know that well. There was a little church there. And uh, so it was a three-hour drive. It was no small commitment for a college boy who had a 70 El Camino who did not make the jaunt. I borrowed the receptionist's brand-new black Thunderbird. So I was driving in style to Holders, Nebraska. Didn't worry about GPS. I didn't worry about MapQuest or anything like that. We just made our way there and found this tiny little church in this tiny little community in central Nebraska. And uh, I'm pretty sure the reason I said I would go is because I'd heard word that the Republican River and the Harlan County Reservoir just south of Holdridge, that the white bass were biting. And so, <laughs> so we threw our fishing rods and reels in our tackle boxes. Uh, Troy Backus, who later went on to, to teach and uh, teaches in the Omaha area now with, at Grace College. But anyway, he was a freshman, I was a senior. We threw our fishing poles in this beautiful black Thunderbird and we went driving to Holdridge, Nebraska. We got there and we were greeted by a, a pretty gruff old man said, kind of sized this up and looked us over and said, uh, you must be the preacher boys. And yeah, we're the preacher boys, you know. And, and uh, so we went through that and he got to saying, well, um, we like to sing here. You know, we're a small congregation, but we like to sing. Would you like to lead songs? I'm not a song leader, but I thought I can't tell him no. So out came from my lips, sure, why not? You know, so we picked out some hymns, and I went through the book little by little, and I was nervous because I'm not a song leader. You know that already, and, and anyway, I picked out, you can always throw some favorites. Is there any favorites out there? That's what they used to do before we had all the, the new praise courses and all that, and so, so we picked out some, and they said, well, we have, a, we have a young gal that's a piano player. She'll play the piano for you. I thought, Phew, okay, that's okay. Uh, you know, I'll at least help a little bit, and uh, so I gave her a list of songs, and we got ready to sing and I kid you not, this is, this is not exaggerated in the least. Here's how she played. Let's see, I can't play much, but... Um, um, let's see, that, that's crazy. One, one note at a time. That's my emphasis. One note at a time. So here I am up there. My friend Troy was a piano player. I should have just had him switch spots. He's looking at me with eyes as big as saucer going, dude, I'm glad it's you up there leading songs and not me. And we are, she is playing one note at a time. I, I mean, she was an attractive college-age girl, but she did not know how to play the piano at all. So I appreciate our organist and pianists each week that play and, and lead us through that. And I'm thinking up there, oh, man, if my friends could see me now in all the glory, you know, and leading songs in Holdridge, Nebraska, trying to get through this. And so I'm nervous and I can just read my friend's lips and like, dude, I am glad it's you up there. So I'm in this awkward situation. Somehow the sermon that day probably matched the ability of that girl's piano playing, so it was a good fit, and we made it through. It was the annual congregational meeting that day. So it was a big day, and um, all nine of us went to the basement for pot potluck, and I, kept, and I just kept thinking... Get me to the river. Get me to the river. Okay? And um, so here I was trying to sing. And when he, I look back and that guy says, we like to sing around here. I quickly discovered when there's one person playing with one finger and there are nine people out there, it's a solo from up here. It's not congregational singing. It's a solo. And so we went on and we sang all four verses of just, I should say, I sang all four verses of Just As I Am. And everybody went home just as they were before they came, I think, okay? Um, and then we got ready to wrap it up, and, and I didn't, we didn't talk about how to wrap it up. And for a, a new preacher, you kind of you don't know how to end things. And so all of a sudden, you get to the end and go, what do I do now? And I was like, well, they said, well, we always have a closing song. I imagine they sang it here at this church, because I think every Christian church in the country sang it. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And so luckily, my home church had sang that, so I was able to attempt another solo, there's this, which was really funny because the gruff old guy that met us did not have a sweet, sweet spirit. 
And I'm pretty sure my spirit wasn't real sweet at the end of that message either, okay? So we made it through the, the song, The Sweet, Sweet Spirit in This Place. And, I, and then we, we ate lunch with them. We jumped in this beautiful brand new black Thunderbird. I mean, it was brand new. And this lady let us drive it down there. And we're driving these country roads in the back hills of the southern Nebraska and getting this thing all dirty. But the fishing was pretty good. In fact, we even threw 16 white bass in the trunk of this car <laughs> on the way home. And... Uh, dumb college kids, but I can remember driving back to Norfolk, Troy had fallen asleep, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, I'm a senior, I'm getting ready to graduate, I'm thinking, is this what I signed up for? A little church with no sweet spirit that has no love and joy in it whatsoever. And as you think through, is this what I'm signing up for? Is this what I want to commit my life to, to be a pastor? I ended up being a youth pastor for a long, long time, maybe that's why, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, but it just made me think, uh, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? What do I do now? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Probably a familiar story in many ways, but Acts 16, and we'll start in verse 16. I want us to read the text, and we'll just dive into that a little bit. Acts 16, starting in verse 16. Paul and Silas, working together here in Philippi. Starting in verse 16, he says, Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days, Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized what, that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was, com uh, jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. We're going to stop right there. Quite a story when you think about it. They were in Philippi doing ministry, preaching God's word there. The slave girl who was a fortune teller had this spirit and she was able to tell the fortune. And what she was saying was, hey, these are, these are God's servants. If you want to come to salvation, listen to them. And so she really wasn't saying anything that bad, but Paul had had enough. We don't quite understand it. I don't quite understand it. But he commanded the spirit to leave and the spirit leaves this, this, this demonic spirit leaves this slave girl. Well, what happened was the owners of this slave girl got kind of upset because as God's word says, when they couldn't make any money offer anymore, they got mad. And so when you mess with people's retirement funds, they get a little mad. When you mess with their salaries, they get a little upset. And now their way of making money was gone and they were left. And so they're ticked off. They get the crowd in an uproar. They go and somehow Paul and Silas end up in prison. Uh, I might mention they were severely flogged and thrown into prison. They were told to keep them a careful watch. That's what the jailer was told to do, keep a careful watch on these rebels. Think, I want us to go back to this a minute. What's going on here? This isn't like prisons, what, what are prisons? This is not like the Newton Correctional Facility. Maybe you've been there before, you've driven by that. This isn't like it. This was a dark, dingy, uncomfortable cell they were in. This, it, it was probably a, a mess. Probably stunk in there. It was probably moldy and musty and it, it would not have been a fun thing to have been in this this wasn't like our modern day prisons not that they're any fun either but this was different never mind the fact that they had been beaten and flogged maybe that takes you back to the passion of the christ where they had the cat of nine tails the leather and they put bone and metal and whatever they could find in there and they flog these sometimes people didn't even survive these floggings and so they're at midnight they're thrown into this dark dingy prison I was able to travel to Ghana one time, about the only time I've ever traveled overseas, 
about five or six years ago with Christ in Youth, and, and we led uh, some Christ in Youth youth sessions over there. It was, it was a great experience, but on one day we didn't have anything to do. We went to a slave castle on the Ivory Coast, and, and it was just incredible. It was empty now, but it was just this great big facility, but it was dingy and dark and just almost evil, even though it had been years and years ago since the slaves, the sla- it was right on the ocean, beautiful ocean, but it was, it was just this dark place, and and the boats would pull right up next to it, and so they lived there, and, and, and it, was just, it just reminded me of maybe what, that's what prison would have been like for Paul. It was just dark and dreary, and I, I can just imagine the slaves in there as they went through the, the door of no return, they called it, and let, loaded the boats. It had to be a dingy, dark, depressing place. And here's Paul and Silas in this type of situation, and what do they do? They're tied up, they're in stocks of some sort, their, their hands are probably extended, their feet are probably placed in these stocks, and at midnight, what are they doing? Singing? I mean, are you kidding me? And, 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 and God's Word says, and the other prisoners listened. They str- and with that, in the text, it means they strained to hear what was going on at midnight. I understand, I, I'm fairly hard of hearing. I, I have to strain, especially in crowded rooms, to, to hear conversations. That's what, that, that's what our word means there. They, they were straining to hear Paul and Silas singing. What would possess them to sing, let alone at midnight, let alone at being flogged, let alone being in prison, for doing nothing wrong? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Barbara's going to sing a song that fits in with our message today and ties it in. What would make you want to sing?
fall down again I can sing cause you picked me up sing cause you're there I can sing cause you hear me Lord when I call to you in prayer I can sing with my last breath sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels and the saints around the throne how can I keep from singing your praise how can What makes you want to sing? I, I don't do a lot of singing. I used to sing in high school when my little sisters, I, I sang in the shower. The Ugly Sister Blues came out of my mouth more than once as I made up songs about my ugly sisters. And uh, What makes you want to sing? One of the cool things about church is it's about the only place where men actually sing anymore. You know, it's cool. What makes you want to sing? Think about that for a minute. What causes that spirit to rise up in you to sing? Why would Paul and Silas want to sing at midnight in a, in a dark, dingy place? Because there was a joy in them that was bigger than their situation. Plain and simple. Isn't it interesting that Paul writes so much about joy? After, after this encounter, he writes the, Philippi, the Philippian church, if you had to say, what does the book of Philippians, in one word, sum up the book of Philippians, what would that word be? Joy. Rejoice. Fourteen times in four chapters, Paul says, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. That's what we think of when we hear the Philippians. Rejoice. I'm not suggesting that we go around with a dumb grin on our face, and even in life's toughest situation, we kind of go, oh, whatever. I'm not saying we have this fake, false sense of joy in our lives. We all recognize life. Life brings a lot of hurt, a lot of pain in every one of us. Every one of us has something that happens, and, and if it isn't happening now, it's going to happen. There's going to be hurt, and there's going to be pain, and there's going to be difficult situations in this life. Roy alluded to that in his communion meditation. And we know by now the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is because of a circumstance that happens. My, my favorite team, the Cardinals, won last night. Woo, we, I'm happy. My son's basketball, oh, we got a Cubs fan right there going, boo, yeah, okay. But, but happiness of, you know, I got a raise at work and things are going good. Or that boy said, or that girl said yes when he asked me out or whatever, you know, type of thing. It, happiness comes from circumstances that seem to go our way and, and we get happy with those things. But what about when things aren't going well? Joy is in spite of the circumstances, we're okay. We know that by now. We've been at church long enough. There's a difference between happiness and joy. But sometimes life is difficult and sometimes joy sort of gets lost. I think John Ortberg said, sometimes I'm joy impaired. Sometimes I am. Sometimes joy isn't there couple quotes on joy. Lewis Smead says, to miss out on joy is to miss out on the reason for your existence. C.S. Lewis, joy is the serious business of heaven. You see, Paul never be, seemed to be running short on joy. It seemed to just be who he was, even though life can be difficult. And again, a series of poor choices, a ch bad choice made here that we make, and all of us have done it, and we look back, and go, I wish I'd never have done that, or I wish I wouldn't have made that decision, or I wish I wouldn't have gone that direction. And we sort of get stuck, and sometimes 
one bad mistake and one bad decision leads to another bad decision and it's just this downward cycle and we get stuck in it and we sort of feel stuck in that situation. And again, we read, Paul understood, he says, the good things I want to do, in Romans 7, he says, the good things I want to do, I don't always do, and the bad things that I don't want to do, I sometimes find myself doing. Sometimes we just feel stuck in a tough situation. Paul understands and can relate to us and to the choice that we have before us. So what kind of joy, where did Paul, what, where did he come up with this joy? What was its source? Someone suggested maybe it was the joy of creation that, that Paul got excited about. Because over and over again, Scripture tells us, for, uh, Psalm 92, For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. Was it the joy of creation? Ever since the beginning, God has partnered with us for us to be managers and stewards of this beautiful land that he created. Psalm 19 once says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth his speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. The skies proclaim... Tim, if you want to show some of those slides, I'm a nature lover. You know, I love to be in the outdoors. I mean, there was just something incredible about the different parts of our country and the world. I mean, just, just enjoy the scenery. You, you think of places you've been. I've been to Colorado. We like to go to Wisconsin in the fall. The leaves turn. Uh, a few years ago, we were canoeing, and the leaves had been turning around every corner. We just kept saying, wow. Was it the joy of creation that, was, that, that, that made Paul want to sing? I don't know. I can find joy in that. I can find joy in the things that he's made. It's gorgeous. I can find joy. Maybe, maybe we lack joy in our lives because as Christians we just sort of walk around looking at all the bad things happening and our heads down and we miss out on joy because we don't ever enjoy his creation. I really doubt that's what motivated him to sing, but it could have been maybe... Maybe it was the joy of serving, and the Philippian letter talks about serving and the joy that we have from serving. But maybe it was something greater than creation, greater than serving. Maybe it was the joy that knowing that he had been saved by a Savior. Who knew better than Paul? We know Paul's past. He was Saul, and he was on the road to Damascus, and, he, and his life has changed forever when Jesus got a hold of him and got, came into his life. And we know his past was full of bad. We've talked about that before here. We, we know he persecuted the church. He was a murderer. Who knew grace greater than Paul? Not very many people. Maybe that was the, the source of his joy. Paul knew his past. We know our past as a sinner. We know the evil in us, and we wish we wouldn't have done this. And, and none of us are this pillar of spiritual maturity. I'm not. I don't stand in front of you. We have other people in, there, in this room have been Christians a long time. None of us are this great, strong pillar of perfection. It's not there. We know our past. We know our struggles. And that's where the joy of grace comes in, the joy of salvation. It just seems to be, joy just seems to be a natural response, a natural byproduct of grace. When we know we've been saved despite our past, there's a joy, a, a deep, deep joy. But as I said, life puts us to the test at times, and sometimes our joy, that, that grace, is put to the test. Difficult circumstances that you find yourself in. Maybe it's a, an upcoming surgery or a surgery. I remember when my father had open-heart surgery. It was kind of a last-minute thing. He went on Friday, and Monday he had to have open-heart surgery. And so we rushed over there, and, and it was just a difficult time. We've always had pretty good health in our family, but it was a time where we just didn't know what the outcome was going to be. We thought everything would go well. We thought the, the bypass surgeries, you know, most of the time they come out good. But there was a time where we said, you know, if, if this doesn't work out, a better day is coming. You've been there. Life, life can be difficult when you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Aging parents, we're there. Barb's folks are, are just going through struggles. Some of you have moms and dads, if you're 50 years and up, Sometimes parents just have struggles and they can't live where they used to live and you're trying to find housing for them and, and it's difficult and joy can escape the situation if, if we don't watch it. But I think what made Paul sing in prison was he knew a better day was coming. He knew what God had promised. John writes, for there was a new heaven and a new earth. 
A better day is coming. A better day is coming. I think that's what motivated Paul and Silas to sing. Even at midnight in a dark, dingy cell, they'd been beaten and flogged. They could still sing praises and hymns to the Lord because that's not the end. That's not the end for the Christian. I want to read a story. Great, great story. Robert Fulgham writes this. I'm just going to read it, read it directly here. Talking about a, a wedding, and, and um, Robert Fulgham says, there was an epic wedding, huge, logistics, 18-piece brass and wind ensemble to gift registries spreading across most of the continental United States. Over 24 bridesmaids, groomsmen, flower petal throwers, and ring bearers. They were of scale seen only during the military invasion of a sizable country. But the plans were all working until the climactic moment of this processional. And he writes, ah, the bride. She had been dressed for hours, if not days. No adrenaline was left in her body. Left alone with her father in the reception hall of the church, while the march of the maidens went on and on and on, she had walked along the tables, laden with gourmet goodies, and absent-mindedly sampled first the little pink and yellow and green mints. Then she picked through the silver bowls of mixed nuts and ate the pecans, followed by a cheese ball or two, some black olives, and a handful of glazed almonds, a little sausage with a frilly toothpick stuck in it, and a couple of shrimps blanketed in bacon, and a cracker piled with liver pate. To wash this down, a glass of pink champagne. Her father gave it to her to calm her nerves. And what you noticed as the bride stood in the doorway was not her dress, but her face. White, for what was coming down the aisle was a living grenade with a pin pulled out. <laughs> Get this, the bride threw up. Just as she walked by her mother. And by threw up, I don't mean a polite little ladylike herb into her handkerchief. She puked. There's just, there's just no nice word for it. I mean, she hosed the front of the chancel, hitting two bridesmaids, the groom, a ring bearer, and me. That's he. Only the two people were seen smiling. Only two people were seen smiling. One was the mother of the groom, and and the other was the father of the bride. <laughs> Fogum explains how they pulled themselves together for a much quieter, gentler ceremony in the reception hall after they'd cleaned things up, and everybody cried as people are supposed to do at weddings, mostly because the groom held the bride in his arms throughout the whole service, and no groom ever kissed the bride more tenderly than he. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> but the best part of the story is 10 years later, everybody was invited back for another party to celebrate this disaster. They watched the whole thing on three TV sets. The mother of the bride had three video cameras going at once during the wedding, and this party was thrown by the mother of the bride herself. How could all these people, when everything had gone, rejoice when everything had gone wrong? Because in spite of the mess, the bride still got the groom. That's all that mattered. In the end, the bride gets to groom. Who's the bride? Who's the groom? A better day is coming. Even in the midst of a wedding gone bad, in the end, the bride gets to groom. 99.9% .9 of the time, that happens. A better day is coming. Think through this in your life a little bit. How does this play out? If someone were to ask, do you consider yourself joyful? What would you say? Or is there this negative spirit that comes from you? You see, really this is what sets us apart, I think, from the world. Joy. Because we know a better day is coming. Is that part of your experience? Or are you just looking down and you're missing the joy of everything that God has in store for you? Easy to get that way, easy to get down, easy to look at the world and go, wow. Paul and Silas sang from prison because they knew a better day was coming. Our worship team is going to come in and, and lead us in our closing song. How's this play out in your life? Things difficult right now? Is there a joy knowing that there's a better day of coming? You know, I go to conferences and different things, and I get 
discouraged when youth ministers talk about how difficult it could be when I was in youth ministry. Or pastors talk about how difficult pastoring can be. It's ministry. If you don't like it, do something different. Life is tough, but you know what? As Christians, a better day is coming. A better day is coming. It sets us apart from the world. And so I ask you, is your life marked by joy? Deep joy, knowing that even in difficult circumstances, there's something worth singing about. Let's stand as we sing this song. Because Jesus has entered your life. If, if you're here today and, and never experienced Jesus, talk to someone who brought you, or you can come talk to me or a leader of our church. We'll share with you the joy of knowing Jesus. It brings peace in our lives, and it teaches us a better day is coming. So if you've never experienced that joy, we invite you to that joy. One last thought. I don't know what makes you want to sing, but what, what makes our Creator want to sing? In the book of Zephaniah, which most of us have not spent much time in in years, probably. I want to read this as we close today. It says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that cool that God sings over us let's pray God I thank you for the life of Paul who teaches us such great truths just by the way he lived his life to sing into those circumstances shows us there is something at his core that helped him endure. Father, for anyone in this room that's going through a difficult season, may we find truth in that. May we find joy in knowing that there's a better day coming. We're thankful that you love us so much that your word says you sing over us. How humbling that is to us. And so I hope today that as we sang to you that, that you found joy in the words of your people. May we leave today marked with joy as we enter our workplaces and our homes and just the difficult things that sometimes happens in life. May we find a joy from knowing you and knowing that there's a better day coming. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.